Welcome, everybody. Today, we got a killer webinar. We're going to be talking about three best practices for account-based marketing follow-up strategy. Um, you've got myself, uh, Gabe Larson, will introduce our ex uh, distinguished – I almost said extinguished. That would have been wrong. We've got our distinguished guest. We'll introduce him in just a minute. <laughs> but as we wait for a couple people to come on in here, um, I want to make sure we're fully loaded. I wanted to play a short video on um, kind of our product and what we're doing, and I'll let you watch it, and then we'll, then we'll rock and roll. Behind every pass, every first down, and every two-minute drill, and behind every game-winning touchdown is a play. Without a playbook, you have no direction, no plan, and no chance of success. But with the right play, you're in position to win. And it's the same in sales. Without the right plays and the right sequence, your sales teams will drop the ball. But with the right playbook built on the right insights, your sales teams are primed for success. That's exactly what Playbooks from InsideSales.com provides. It's a revolutionary sales platform that gives sales reps the plays they need to close deals. Who to call, when to call them, how to contact them, and how to manage multiple prospects moving through the sales funnel at once. Playbooks is based on decades of sales knowledge and the largest and most varied database of sales interactions in the world. 100 billion interactions and growing. So sales reps are always fed plays based on proven best practices and accurate data, which means they get the best plays at the best times. With all that power at their fingertips, even the rookies will sell like veterans. And the entire team will perform like all-stars. Playbooks will fuel more contacts, more conversations, and more closed deals. Because with Playbooks, you're always in a position to win. All right, and that's pretty good. Not a bad video. I like it. Good. Um, let's move on. Um, so, got to make a quick plug. If you haven't heard of our Playmaker podcast, it's a must. It's a must listen to. Um, you can check it out on iTunes. You can see it at InsideSales.com slash podcast. We talk about uh, real problems, real people, real solutions. Pretty interesting. Feel free to check it out. Um, hit me up on LinkedIn if you want to learn more about it. Or if you've got good guests, you guys, if you feel like you know good guests, make sure you know. Uh, let me know. Um, so how is this going to work? It's going to be about 30 minutes. You can join the conversation using hashtag Playmaker, um, and you will see this webinar on demand later. Share it with your friends. Check it out. Um, we got some great guests today. Um, unfortunately, Kaysen could not join. Um, he's on site at a client, was running a little bit behind, so we're going to just have to deal with <laughs> Phil Wenzel, um, who is the head of our enterprise business development team. Phil, how the heck are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah, no, man. Well, we're excited to get into this. I know you've been a big proponent and a big believer. Um, you've done a lot with these strategies that the marketing team and the sales development team put together. Um, so we'll be interested to get your feedback. Um, Phil, do you want to tell us just a little bit about yourself and what you do at Inside Sales? Roger, that will do. So I've been in this current role uh, leading the enterprise effort for the last six months. Uh, we've had tremendous uh, opportunities to see the Playbook uh, platform kind of develop right before our eyes. And so I've gotten to know pretty well before my time uh, in this role. I was uh, lucky enough to be part of the landing team in our MIA office in London for the previous 18 months. So I had a similar role where I managed and led this development throughout uh, Western Europe and uh, got some great experience there. So essentially, this is a development professional, uh, lucky enough to be uh, kind of an international twist there, and um, I'm here today with Enterprise, so that's the fill. Love it, man. Appreciate Appreciate you joining. Um, want to make sure that the audience is engaged here, so everybody, if you can, open up that Q&A box at the bottom. Um, put your name and where you're from, 
and, and I'd love to keep that Q&A flowing. We want to answer your questions, make this as engaging as possible. Uh, Tom, thanks for joining. Peter, thanks for joining. Mark, Jamie, great, great. Um, awesome. Some people I know on here, some people I don't. But again, go ahead and type your name and where you're from. Get used to using that Q&A box because um, we're going to want you to use it. Yeah, Candice, Jolene, Laura, um, is it Brendan? Brendan, uh, Allison, Mike. Whoa, whoa, whoa. We got a lot coming in. Fantastic. So, um, guys, we're going to start into um, uh, the, the session here. So I want to ask you, how many of you are running an ABM strategy? Give me a, a yes or a no if you are currently or have run an ABS, a, ABM excuse me, strategy in the recent past. Um, while you do that, I'm going to jump into this. So this is something that we did. It's actually been, Phil, how long ago was this? This was a year ago. I mean, this is last year now. Yeah, uh, it was last fall. Right? Right? Almost a year ago. Yep. That, yeah, so it's, it's been almost a year. Um, looks like, every, well, you got a couple. Steve's not running ABM. Uh, Candice, you guys have run some ABM stuff. Um, I've already got a couple people asking me, what's the difference between ABM and ABS? Because I'm, I'm <laughs> looks like Tom. <laughs> That's your right. favorite I, term. I, I miss I misspoke there, but guys, a lot of similarities, Tom, specifically between account-based sales and account-based marketing, um, but do know that there are some differences, mainly being that account that on, if, it's, if it's account-based sales, sales runs it. They initiate it. They follow up on it. ABM is obviously run from marketing, and then sales follows up on it. One big difference we often find, and we'll be talking a lot about follow-up today, is that Often one of the things lacking in ABM is a, is a good follow-up strategy because marketing and sales don't talk enough. In ABS, you typically have a little more of a defined um, um, follow-up strategy. So, Tom, if you want to talk more about that, hit me up on LinkedIn. Would love to kind of debate and discuss some of those pieces. So, so we ran this ABM um, campaign, and as Phil said, it was about a year ago, and it was killer, you guys. I mean, the concept was spot on. In the bottom right-hand corner, you see it. So we had this kind of strategy around it where we said, don't be blindsided. It was around forecasting and pipeline management. We have a tool called Predictive Pipeline. helps people get visibility, accessibility into not only their pipeline, but into true predictive forecasting. So we wanted to get the word out. Because a lot of people just know us for our cadence tool, our, our strategic prospecting tool. So we run this, this campaign, and it was killer, right, Phil? I mean, the idea was to go with footballs, and Steve Young sits on our board, and um, so what we did is you can see up in the left-hand corner there, we basically got the inside sales branded footballs, and we got Steve Young to sign them. Phil, do you remember? Was it was about how many did we end up sending out? Was it about a hundred and was it? Yeah, I can't remember. I think we've I think got that on the next slide. Close to about a hundred. Gold was one hundred and fifty. Yes, we sent about one hundred and fifty. Again, this is ABM. Um, and you can see some of the other stuff that kind of came with it. It was in a nice box, had a little brochure, real, real professional. Um, and we had some fantastic results. In fact, I'm going to go to the results now. And, Phil, maybe you can just speak briefly to kind of this slide, and then I'll add it. And I want to go back to some of the lessons learned from what we what, what, when, when we did this campaign. Great. So we took some time to identify some of these targeted accounts many of which we'd engaged with in the past. Um, you know, perhaps we had some inbound leads or met them at a trade show. And, and, and there are some other cases where they're literally net new contacts where we were just getting to know these companies. And we may had a, a few friendlies in there, maybe some uh, employees of ours had worked with these contacts in the past. So there was a lot of different stories to how these accounts came about. And I think that's an overlying um, you know, strategy or takeaway that I would always have if I started an ABM campaign is, uh, you know, identifying those specific decision makers uh, is is no joke and no easy task. And thankfully, in Inside Sales, we do have uh, a, a predictive platform that helps us uh, hone in our efforts and kind of makes our admin work more efficient. So that's kind of our story. But, um, behind those 150 accounts. Um, you'll see, you know, the numbers speak for themselves. We had a pretty high percentage of uh, conversion. We had 39 appointments set. Um, 
you know, amounting to 22%. And then we had a 15x uh, percentage of uh, return on investment regarding pipeline building. Now, most of these accounts were enterprise, um, you know, meaning that these were some of the, the largest companies in the world. And so uh, a lot of these accounts are actually still in play when it comes to the sales cycle, uh, with these sales cycles being uh, much longer than, you know, your typical, uh, you know, mid-market or sure. SMB deal. But, you know, so sure. a lot of these are still in play, but it was a, it was a good campaign. Yeah, I love it. Um, so um, 39 of 150. <laughs> Mike is saying the math is wrong there. <laughs> Mike, appreciate it. That's a slightly higher percentage, 26%. Uh, who did the math on that? My goodness, fire them! Yeah, we're going to serve them there. Thanks, Mike, for that. Um, we just, yeah, we were rounding down um, multiple percentage points. Thanks for that, Mike. Um, so <laughs> yeah, that's right. I so appreciate the comment. So Lindsay asked a good question here. You know, just doubling down on Phil's comment. You know, how do you often think through who should get? Uh, this type of this type of approach, and Phil, I thought did it did a good job. Let me just add one point to that, Lindsay. Um, you know, there's always going to be an art and a science here. What the typical approach is in an ABM strategy is uh, marketing says we have budget, and they walk over to the sales team and say, Hey, who do you want us to send this to? And then sales will um, you know give them their top ten accounts or something like that. That's kind of the typical way. Not a huge fan of that, but again, you've got to start somewhere. So ideally, in the ideal situation, you'd use a little more analytics behind that. So if you've got an engagement score, if you're figuring out what accounts, um, ideally potentially of your top 100 or your top 1,000, are actively engaging with you, this is a great way to then execute a play on those that are already working to find out more about you. So that's one thing people ought to take into consideration. They often don't. Number two is, um, rather than just subjectively choosing those accounts, it is great, Lindsay, to be able to say, hey, um, you, you know, let's use some data or some analytics. We've got what we call our neural score. It goes through and basically looks at all the attributes, right, and says, hey, which accounts are most likely to close or what are your optimal or target accounts. So you combine engagement score with closability score, then bring in some of that art, you got a way tighter model, and that's kind of the way we approached um, all. We approach all of our account-based marketing or account-based sales campaigns. So I think that's an interesting piece there. A couple other questions that have come in: um, What are you defining as an account? Is that a, a current customer or a current prospect? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that, Laura, because we're actually just starting now to do some more um, um, of these types of campaigns on current customers, and I think you're going to see some really fun stuff there that people don't often do. Most of this is always attributed to prospecting, um, but we're starting to test some on the customer side. More to come on that a little bit later. But what you are seeing right now, Laura, these are prospects. These accounts are prospecting accounts. Good question. So, um, Lydia, um, good question on the ROI. <laughs> Guys, appreciate Keep bringing the Q&A. We can want to answer what you want to talk about, not what Phil and I think are, are, is, is important or probably boring in some cases. So ROI on this is a little misleading, Lydia, because, yeah, 15X is a big one. This is actually a 15X growth in pipe year over year. Um, so compared to what, what we were doing the previous quarter, this campaign jumped us an incredible amount just getting people into the pipeline. Now, one of the things you want to be considerate of on all ABM campaigns, and we got a couple people asking a little bit about tracking ROI on – so we got, it uh, looks like it was Beth, and then and, and really, real, well, another person kind of asked a little bit of a question about this. So uh, when you think about ROI, you guys, on, on ABM, you do want to track it all the way, um, and this goes for ABM or ABS, all the way through to close, because we are seeing um, this, this kind of euphoric effect um, where basically sometimes you'll send stuff out and people will take the meeting They'll take it, but then they don't actually move all the way down, you know, the pipeline and end up closing. So you can – we call it a false positive where it's like, oh, my goodness, I got all of this stuff, but I wasn't able to track it all the way down. So do make sure you track it all the way down. So, Laura, um, what are the ROI units, number of contacts, pipeline, weighted value? This was actually just pipeline dollars. This is purely just pipeline dollars, um, time one versus time two. Um, good question, Laura. Appreciate it. So – 
Um, a couple of the things, though, that we learned from this that we wanted to kind of say, again, it turned out to be a very effective campaign, um, this kind of football campaign. But the thing that I think was probably the most interesting was taking a step back after and being able to say, well, you know, what was the good, the bad, and the ugly? And I wanted to highlight just a couple of those pieces for you, and then we'll get kind of into this second campaign. It looks like I can't go back on my slide. Mm, that's okay. A couple of the learnings, you guys, um, were, number one, the cleanliness of data. Um, boy, when you run a, a, a ABM or ABS, if you don't have the right context, you don't have the right addresses, boy, you're really going to run into some problems there. Number two um, was, was a lot of the conversations between sales and marketing. How can, you know, again, the campaign was fairly effective, but we felt like the communication flow, the follow-up, it could have just been a little bit, t and this is true with most ABM campaigns, that relationship with sales and marketing always gets pushed to its end. So what, one of the things we wanted to highlight today was the, the difference. I mean, a year ago, we didn't have our Playbooks product. Um, we had what we call basically Power Dialer, and it has some real great functionality. Bringing in Playbooks and using it as a, a follow-up engine, as a strategic tool within our ABM campaign, really took it to the next level, and I want to get into that just a, a, a little bit. Um, so Steve's having a couple of troubles with the slides. That's fine. Um, um, Lydia, so good question. So rather than ROI, a more accurate designation would be protected sales dollar. Yeah, Lydia, I think that was just a mistype there. It's certainly not an ROI because it's not a close. It should have just probably said pipeline or projected dollars. Totally agree with that. Um, how are we calculating the, the percentage of accounts versus appointments? So that was just simple math on that coast. So basically all we said was if we've got X number of accounts and we got blank X number of meetings, one divided by the other gives us that um, um, number of footballs basically sent over the appointments that were had. Uh, hopefully that, that answers that. So, so that was kind of where we were. And I want to get into a little bit as to now where we are now because I think it was a real uptick in the communication flow the data integrity, and the movement as we basically move forward. So this was the second campaign we ran, um, and this one's fairly recent. Phil, when did we run this one? This one's um, um, – God, this Great. is actually ongoing. We, th this is pretty recent, correct? Great question. So we actually got this started in May, so quite recent. Quite recently. So um, – so this one's slightly different, um, but again, a similar approach. And we are finding, if you didn't see it, you guys, you need to check out our coffee campaign webinar we did last week. Um, you can go and check out labs.insidesales.com to learn more about that campaign if you really want to dive into it. But we're finding some real effective ways to bring gifting and handwritten notes into the sales process. Um, we love, we love, love, love when it's sales rep driven. Again, we call that more ABS, account-based sales plays. Um, so we're loving some of the things we see here. So this one is specifically is called our poker play. Um, and this one had a lot more sales and marketing alignment, um, some real strategies that went into it. This was actually originally designed by sales and run sa by sales. And the play worked so well, we actually scaled it out and had multiple people run it. But um, some real interesting things here. So the general idea was we had a branded poker set um, that we sent out to a group of individuals, again, similar concept in how we figured out who to send it out to and why we wanted to send it out to them. And then we had a follow-up strategy revolved around it to see if we couldn't actually get in the door, get an appointment, and move forward. So... Um, Phil, do you mind talk, talking a little bit more on, on kind of your involvement in this campaign and kind of what we did, just at a high level? I want to get into details in a minute, but just kind of the design and some of the pieces around this poker play. Great. Yeah, happy to. So, you know, kind of repeating the process of understanding and identifying who we wanted to reach out to, that was obviously an obvious step. Uh, the next step naturally was aligning with marketing to make sure that the messaging uh, in each step of the plays was aligned with what we're talking about, what we're about. 
and finally, uh, a huge perk of the, the playbook idea for us was, you know, part of our pre career progression in uh, the business development effort in inside sales had included, uh, you know, the shift between uh, being an inbound rep where you fielded a lot of, you know, marketing produced leads, kind of like one of those high volume type roles where you might be newer to business development, transitioning from that to a more proactive outbound model where these reps were being more proactive rather than reactive. They were account mapping into enterprise accounts and reaching out to Fortune 500 companies, um, getting in contact with C-level executives and, you know, understanding their needs and creating, uh, you know, business opportunities. So a lot of these new reps were actually new to this type of uh, sales uh, cycle and playbooks automated so much of that effort. They did not have to really worry about uh, how to manage the cadence when they did the follow-up of these, uh, you know, the follow-up of the, of the ABM launch. So that's kind of high level. No, that's why perfect. These, uh, that's perfect. Why, I mean, it's so good for us. Yeah, I mean, it became interesting, you guys, to be able to have a tool that facilitates that marketing and, and sales conversation a little bit more. So we wanted to kind of open up the kimono and kind of show you some details around this play. And just how it was a little bit tighter and the tool facilitated some of that tightness. So you can see the strategy that was run. Again, this was basically April, May. Um, you had an AE portion, a BDR portion, and then you had kind of this marketing portion and there was different pieces that fit into that. But the follow-up strategy was really tight in how people should be managing their role and then structuring more or less of their follow-up. Um, so again, you had emails as part of that, phone calls as part of it, you had some brochures, all focused around, again, not our, our predictive pipeline product, but around this Playbooks product, something that, uh, again, we offer to the market for, for more strategic prospecting situation. Um, so um, Lydia says to suggest, you know, my perception is marketing is overwhelmingly female. You're sending footballs and poker sets What's the gender split of your prospect? It's an interesting concept. Um, I mean, I think what you want to try to do in your market is figure out exactly what Lydia is getting to is what, what would potentially resonate with your target audience or what resonates with the people you're sending it to. Um, you know, we're typically sending, Lydia, to answer your question, we're going after the VP and SVP of sales. Um, I don't know the, the split between female and male on that, but I think it's absolutely important to know your audience um, we had one guy I was talking to, <laughs> you'll, you'll appreciate this, Lydia. Um, um, they actually sent out Omaha Steaks, um, which some of you may be familiar with. It's a kind of a popular meat in Omaha. It's got some, some brand recognition there. They sent that out to a lot of their prospects. Um, well, one of their prospects happened to be Muslim uh, and, and, you know, for religious reasons, did not eat that particular meat. Um, and was somewhat offended by that. And so classic example, I think, Lydia, of knowing your audience and what tart, what gifts will actually land and resonate with those. So um, I think we went through that prospecting idea and really figured that out, and I think that's important for, for everybody to, to definitely do. So here's kind of the six-week chart. This is how it looked, again, really more scripted, and we'll get into exactly how kind of that play looked like in a minute. There was a real strong communication plan that we went over, and then here was some real – some of the key learnings that we we went through, and Phil talk, touched on a couple of those, but Phil, maybe you can kind of start this piece. Some of the learnings or best practices you found in building a follow-up campaign after ABM actually sets in. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, many of you who are, are uh, included in this webinar have probably uh, reviewed some of Gabe's uh, cadence studies in the past, and uh, we actually took to heart a lot of these uh, studies ourselves. We uh, understood that the previous campaign that we did in the fall, we were pretty raw. We understood who we wanted to target, but we realized uh, with the combination of, you know, the lack of technology and this uh, lack of iteration and, and testing, we realized that we weren't aggressive enough in uh, following up with the campaign. So, uh, you know, fast forward to this year, 
we weren't, you know, overly aggressive. I, I guess I'd like to call us pleasantly persistent, but we had a very methodical cadence of when to send out the set, when to give a phone call, what are you going to say in that call? If it's a voicemail, we don't give them word for word. We don't like them to read some scripts, but we give them a high level overview of some of the message, messaging that they need to, you know, exemplify all of the emails were taken care of for them. Uh, and then finally, it was, uh, it was really the timing of a lot of these uh, steps that was really important for us because we had not really tested these plays in the past. You know, fast forward to this year, we had seven to eight months of testing various plays within playbooks, and that helped us get an increased conversion rate uh, in sending appointments and engaging with these target accounts. I think the thing that probably impressed me the most, Phil, was the ability um, – what, so, so marketing initiated and actually sent out the, the, you know, the poker chips in this case. Um, but as soon as that landed, as soon as that gift landed, a notification was triggered – and um, somebody, yep. the contact associated, was auto-enrolled so that the play basically started. Like there wasn't this weird disconnect between, yep. hey, marketing did something, and then, hey, let's, hey, oh, oh, it's been four days. Why don't you maybe start following up on it? There, it was a real cool automation kind of all designed to work together to, to immediately start doing it once the gift had landed. Can you touch on that for a second? Great point. Yeah, great point. And, you know, I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, as a result, you know, some of these plays and cadences weren't exactly in sync, and that's great. That's fine. The reps weren't necessarily engaging with the same number of, you know, same stage in the play, simply because, uh, you know, the, you know, mail takes a, a very amount of time to get to different parts of the country, and it's not as simple as getting the team together and saying, okay, guys, today, or and gals, Today is uh, XYZ play. It, it's not that simple. The auto enrollment was crucial because it helped them automate uh, their engagements. And it, it really was uh, kind of a lifesaver when it came to that. I think that's a real game changer, right? I mean, to be able to have that automation kind of built in to streamline that. When I heard that, I was like, oh, my goodness, I think that's super Super powerful. So um, those are some of the best practices, again, to really start to bring those two pieces together of sales and marketing, some of the best practices we learned. But we want to continue to dive into this and show you some of the secret sauce. So one is just a seven-step process to build great plays or, quote, unquote, great campaigns um, that bring sales and marketing together. And we call this closers. It's your ability to close more deals. So you do want to start out, and then I want to actually get into the cadence that we use on the – uh, on the actual campaign around the poker set. Um, so you have campaign, that, that's your strategy. You want to start with a strategy. So, okay, what is this going to be called? This is going to be our, think of it as a theme or an overarching concept. We're going to go poker chips. Um, this is going to, that's going to be our general strategy. The list comes in as to who we're going to be targeting. We talked a little bit about that. The offers are what offers that we can actually put in the play. That would be a research report or an attachment or the actual poker chips themselves. Uh, we always like to, again, give a name to it and then bring offers in as we think about our strategy. The skills are going to be what you actually write, what you say. So what is in the copy? What's on the landing page? What's in the email? What's in the voicemail? The effort is the actual cadence that you drive. It's the effort that you put, how many calls, how many voicemails, what's the strategy and structure, duration, spacing of those different activities. Reporting in systems is where people often go astray. What, what are the ROI metrics that we're going to be tracking to see how effective this play works? And then systems is how do we use something like playbooks in conjunction with the Marketo or an Elico or some other marketing tool to be able to really determine uh, and automate, optimize this process of running a strategic outreach initiative. So that's our seven-step process on how to build a strategic play bringing marketing and sales together. And then here's a deep dive on the effort. So when we, when we looked at our particular play around the poker chip, this is actually what we kind of broke down and did 
um, and maybe Phil, you can kind of just walk us through a little bit of a high level as to how this worked. And we're going real tactical, but we wanted to kind of open up the kimono and give you guys just what we did and why why it was successful. You want to hit that quickly, Phil? Absolutely, absolutely. So I think it's important to uh, note that again, this is a kind of generalized template. Uh, it gives you an idea of how far apart. Uh, in regards to business days, some of these touches are. Uh, again, the play is entirely predicated upon when they get notified that the package was received and we can engage Fair. Um, yeah, with the great people. Point. And, and they were very impressed with the timing, uh, again. And uh, they, they really felt like they were, they were special, that we knew about them. We often, you know, you know, customize these emails, you know, maybe share something that we've learned from their website about what's going on with their company, et cetera. So they really felt like we, they were the apple in our eye. So that's, that's a really important point. But, you know, there's nothing else that I can really add other than what I've already said. You know, the, the, the automation and messaging is, is uh, important because, you know, again, you know, you have some of these newer untrained, not untrained, but some of these greener, salespeople that may um, <laughs> be, you know, essentially aligning or, you know, talking to some of these uh, high-level executives about what we do for the first time. And, you know, marketing is always up in arms about making sure that, we're, you know, we're saying the right things and make sure that we're, we're on the same page. So it really is um, a game saver in how we, in terms of alignment. So that's really yeah, high I love level, it. I uh, love it. what I talk about this slide, so. Yeah, I mean, I still think the coolest thing, and um, we got multiple people talking about it uh, on on kind of the Q and A box here, is just that concept, that automation of letting once it hits the ground and then auto enrolling them in a place so that it can fire off. I mean, that is uh, we've got um, <laughs> we got three or four people kind of bringing that in, and I totally agree. I think that's um, that's that's kind of the uh, was a highlight for me when I first heard it as well. What do you think of the cadence, you guys? Um, you kind of see this here. Do you feel like that's too aggressive? Do you feel like that's not aggressive enough um, as a kind of a follow-up strategy for this, this potential ABM concept? What do you like? What do you don't like? And I'm going to go into just a couple pieces here. So, again, there's a little bit of generic uh, around it because it was triggered based on when, it, when the gift landed. But notice that you, hit, you, you send out the poker set. Once the gift lands, you hit them pretty hard with this call voicemail email strategy. And, again, the language and the lingo kind of ties in around the poker set there. Then one day later, you hit another phone call and a voice message. Then you wait until the following week again or a handful of business days before you do another phone call. Then it kind of trails off to that second week. So all in all, you've got basically two business weeks, and you're hitting exactly kind of that 10-touch number there. But to Phil's point, notice the duration is about two business weeks, and then the spacing is pretty tight around the gift and everything kind of hits to it. Um, interested in some of your feedback as to do you like it, do you not like it? Um, um, so let's see. So Laura says, um, my VP probably wouldn't like it. Five calls and three voice messages in one week. Very aggressive considering you likely drop off, um, will likely drop off to nothing thereafter. So it is a little bit longer, Laura. That may not come out exclusively, but those five calls are over two full weeks, right? So you kind of have, 10 business days, so a little less aggressive. I would agree with you if you went five calls in one week. It's a strategy, but probably a little bit, uh, pretty, probably pretty intense strategy. A couple of people asking why no social in this, um, and, and that's actually a good question. I, I'd probably, let's say there's, a, there's room for social in this, uh, potentially, well, probably throughout, uh, up front and, and after. Um, so I like that suggestion, and, and that's probably... Um, a, a good, if not a necessary add, add there. Oh, go ahead, Phil. Th thoughts on that? Oh, so I could speak to that. That's actually a great point. I appreciate that. So we're actually testing right now, including uh, both uh, LinkedIn profile views or some sort of Twitter engagement as part of the, the play uh, in, in mm -hmm. future iterations. And I'm not just talking about ABM, but just using this platform in general. And uh, we're really excited to see results because we have seen some positive engagement uh, there. So that's that's an excellent uh, addition to uh, what we're doing. So, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. So a um, couple other questions. Um, 
So Stephen says this probably wouldn't work in the oil and gas industry. So Stephen would love to hear why, what, why not, or what's the thing that kind of tips the tips it to make it potentially not not useful in in, in your world. Uh, Costa says, hey, when leaving the voicemails, was your team um, that tested this saying they wanted an appointment, or was it just general dialogue of the voicemail? Can you speak a little bit to kind of the voicemail strategy or just the, the content yeah. of that field? Yeah, that's a good. Appreciate that. So we don't necessarily want we don't want to waste people's time, and we do not set an appointment unless we at least get an understanding initially of uh, some of the sales process and uh, possible needs that they have. We definitely understand that these are the right decision makers, and that's a win. But we still need a little more information as to um, what they're up to, what their stewardship and ownership is in the business, and whether we can really fill in the gaps. If so, yes, an appointment would be the next step. But initially, it's just to uh, start a dialogue. Yeah. So most of these, um, Coasted it to go a little deeper, most of it was just the, the great thing about running a play is that everything kind of builds off each other, right? A lot of times with cadence strategies, people just start hunting and pecking. So I'll do a phone call here, a random email here, maybe another email there. N- none of it connects together. That's the great advantage of using a system like Playbooks. You, you build a play, everything builds off each other, so the emails connect with the GIF, the voicemails connect with the emails, which connect with the GIFs, and you kind of get this nice educational, almost nurturing strategy that goes throughout it. So um, so Stephen said, I make about 30 to 35 calls a day sending poker sets to all my potential clients in hopes to set a meeting. Sounds rather expensive and time-consuming. Great question. So, um, uh, Kosa, I'm glad that worked out for you. Um, so, Stephen, yeah, guys, this is a big debate, right? Um, and, and Stephen, you, you nailed it. As being a sales rep, we're kind of talking about an account-based marketing play with a strategic sales follow-up. That's kind of the use case we're talking about, and it's a very interesting um, problem that we're solving specifically with a technology tool to bring these two people together, meaning sales and marketing, when they typically just never do. Your use case, though, Stephen, being a sales rep, and wanting to run an ABS strategy, you're right. You've got to probably think of it slightly different. Um, so we talked about in our last webinar, there's multiple levels of, of high-impact mailers, and this is the sixth pillar of a cadence, and I'm telling you, it's coming on fast. Um, and I say six pillars of cadence, again, voicemail, email, social, et cetera. High-impact mailers is one that's coming on so, 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 so fast, especially in certain industries. Um, but you've got to find that cost or ROI balance. So, Stephen, one of the things you're going to want to potentially try is don't go to branded poker sets. That's like level four. Um, that's, that's costly. What you may want to try is just a handwritten note, and there's some automated tools you can hit me up after. I can give you some of those. Um, we have some partnerships going with them. That's, that's pretty cheap. That's looking at a buck a card, maybe two bucks a card, something that's very effective, um, can go out to some of your prospects. It's not $80 or $100, but you can use it in more of a transactional model and hit a lot of your accounts. So, it's something to consider, but you're right. It's it's always going to be more expensive than a, than an email. But again, something you may may want to test. Um, do you have experience with offering gift following a meeting versus just sending one out up front? So, um, um, so yeah, Stephen, make sure you hit me up. Let, let's have that conversation. Hit me up on LinkedIn after, and let, let's take that dialogue offline around some of the vendors and some of the ways you can do it. Because I do think. It's something you're going to want to test, and there's cheaper ways to do it. Um, I got a couple other people asking the same thing. So, guys, um, Tom, uh, not Tom, so so many questions coming in. Sorry, guys, I'm getting a little behind here. Um, So, Krista, same thing as Stephen. Hit me up after, and we can talk about some of these different vendors and the way we approach the five different levels of that high-impact mailer. Um, So, Robert, uh, I love the questions, guys. Keep them coming. So, Robert says, do you have experience with offering gift? Oh, (laughs) I'm getting behind, Robert. I'm sorry. I already I already read this out loud, but we'll do it again. So do you have experience with offering gifts following a meeting versus just sending them out up front? Oh, my goodness, Robert. I'm so glad you asked that. So I'm actually sitting in a client's office here in Dallas. Um, uh, it, it's, I love the upfront one. And, again, we're finding this to be a very effective method, high-impact mailers, as another pillar of cadence. And, again, the definition of cadence is a sequence of activities to boost contact and qualification rates. So great use case there, but Robert opens up a whole other kimono of where you can use some of these types of gifts. So we just got done with an in-person meeting. My go-to, and I've always been a handwritten note guy, 
I take a picture with that person. So I just took a picture an hour ago with this person. I slap it on the front of my card. I have an automated system to do that. It's a handwritten note. It's going to pop out. Um, he will get that probably in three days from now. And you wouldn't believe how much more that tightens that relationship. I've often gone back into clients. and They have that picture of me and them standing on their desk. So I love that use case. The problem is it's a little harder to track to ROI. That builds the relationship. I've also found it very effective to use it for when deals close, as well as um, when current customers start to go cold or you're trying to do an upsell. So there's fun ways you can build these types of things, Robert, into your overall sales structure. A big proponent at the beginning, but I'm actually you'll, I'm using it as we speak here with this, this client here in Dallas. Okay. Um, I hope you like the long-winded answer, but I, I love that, Robert, because I'm, I'm doing it right now. Um, um, and I, I, well, I don't have a picture of you and I, Robert. I'd send you one, one as well. But if you want to experience a this technology of, of handwritten notes and systems, hit me up. I, I think it's so cool, you guys. I think I think it's kind of the the thing that's coming next. Because let's be honest, and I know I'm going down a rabbit hole here, but um, prospecting relationships, it's all about being different. So if you're just emailing, and this goes back to our conversation here, Stephen, if you're just emailing and calling, don't get me wrong, it's great, um, but throwing in something every once in a while to throw a curb is going to be, uh, it, it sets you apart from the crowd, and I think that's what sometimes we're always looking to do. Wow. Long answers, you guys. Um, so part of what we took to get today was some of our best practice cadences. Um, you got to use them for different use cases, but you'll be able to find that in your downloads or you can grab that uh, on the InsideSales.com resource section. Those are some example cadences that we've found to be effective in different use cases, so feel free to check that out. Uh, we talked a little bit about this email notification concept. We showed that. Again, I think that's one of the more powerful concepts of bringing sales and marketing together. We wanted to end here. A um, couple of you look like you're jumping coast. Appreciate it. Please do connect with me, Coast, on, on LinkedIn. I'll be offended if you jump and you don't continue the conversation. Um, so this is what Playbooks looks like, you guys. Basically what happens, again, is we set up this play, a step-by-step -step process that says, hey, we're going to send out the mailer. That will be step one. And then we'll do um, you know, a follow-up. That will be step two. And then another follow-up, step three. And you can kind of build the whole strategy and play here, capture what's working, and share it with others. So if you remember what I said is that, that poker set – actually was something that was started out of our boss and office. Just a couple reps got together and said, hey, we're going to try this out. It was so effective that we literally took that play from Playbooks and was able to insert it into our BDRs as we ran it more of an ABM strategy. So being able to systematically take and build these plays and then follow up on them can be really, really fantastic. So, Phil, this is more your expertise here. Um, and then I want to finish up with the results of, of, of the, the two plays kind of side by side. But can you talk about some of the benefits of playbooks from your perspective as a sales development leader and how that helps you optimize a, kind of the entire process? Happy to. So I would say one of the best uh, perks that I have is I'm, I have the ability to create a lot of different plays in a relatively short amount of time and, again, kind of iterate some of the practices that we know are working but then tailor the plays depending on whether, you know, give it, you know, industry, uh, maybe some other contextual geography, et cetera. So um, one, you know, one example of that is we're actually running a campaign specific to our financial targets. And with our, uh, you know, our friends in finance, they are engaged a little bit differently than, you know, uh, one that might be in software. So I'm able to create a play within – 10 minutes if I already have my writing material and launch it out to the team uh, immediately. So I can condition and change the way they operate based off of what I'm learning and just the context of the, uh, the campaign that we're running on a day-to-day -day basis. So it makes my life a lot easier. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of great tools out there for not only just leadership, everyone has those tools. If we have a rep or a rock star that – is finding a strategy that really works for him or her, they have the ability to share that with their peers. And so it's a great crowdsourcing opportunity as well. Yeah, yeah, love it. Um, 
So a couple other questions coming in, uh, multiple people asking about kind of the PDF cadence. We've got Lydia. Um, it looks like John asked about that as well. Um, not Stephen. Um, probably not that important. So, um, guys, the idea on, on that PDF cadence download document, you'll see some, some different things around roles. One of the ideas of building plays is to be able to say, and, we, and this worked very well for us, right? So we send the poker chips, but we then want to have a follow-up strategy because um, we may have actually sent it to a couple different people in a company. So maybe we send it to the head of sales and the head of sales operations. And so you run a slightly different play for the CIO, the CMO, the CEO, the CSO. I mean, these different personas sometimes re respond or resonate with different messaging. So that's the idea. We, we do I like to build plays often around personas that tie into different campaigns. So that's kind of the food for, food for thought there. Um, uh, yeah, okay, great. Um, so let's finish up here. So guys, results on this one. Um, again, ROI was focused more on pipeline than on return on investment. But you can see kind of the difference. Both campaigns worked very well, but when we really doubled down, got tied around kind of that communication between sales marketing, cleaned up the data a little bit, brought in playbooks to really systematize and structure that follow-up in a way that literally kicked off a play as soon as the gift was signed. Um, it just took it to the next level. And we felt like that was powerful enough that we wanted to share that with the audience, talk about how we're finding results using some of our own tools to bring sales and marketing together. Anything you want to add to that, Phil, or on, the, on the results piece? Absolutely. So um, I don't know if there's really a, a measurement that shows on this slide, but it was not only uh, a higher percentage conversion, but it, the speed of which – these appointments were set, it happened a lot faster. A lot of it had to do with the more, you know, <laughs> involved and aggressive cadence. So I guess there's some obvious factors to that, but we seemed uh, to see the results a lot sooner than we did in the first iteration. So that is high level, uh, something I can add uh, to the, you know, the obvious results on the slide. Awesome. Awesome. Fantastic. So um, appreciate that, Phil. So guys wrapping up here again, um, offended. That's the word I'm going with here. I will be offended if you do not connect with me on LinkedIn. Please continue the conversation, at least with Phil and myself. Happy to debate and discuss. Um, we've got a couple of people who have already connected with me. Ken um, just connected with me and said you offered to connect, so I did it. So <laughs> thanks, Ken. Um, I'll connect with you. It looks like you got a pretty interesting background. Would love to kind of um, talk with you a little further. So please, guys, continue the conversation. LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, um, email, whatever else, always happy to discuss account-based marketing and account-based sales strategy. So if you haven't already, check out Playbook's killer product to be able to build pipeline in an effective way to bring those two teams that are often at odds together back together. So um, again, thanks so much. A couple other questions. Our time is out. Hit me up on LinkedIn. Thanks, everybody, and have a fantastic day. Welcome, everybody. Today we got a killer webinar. We're going to be talking about three best practices for account-based marketing follow-up strategy. Um, you've got myself, uh, Gabe Larson, will introduce our ex uh, distinguished – I almost said extinguished. That would have been wrong. We've got our distinguished guest. We'll introduce him in just a minute. <laughs> but as we wait for a couple people to come on in here, um, I want to make sure we're fully loaded. I wanted to play a short video on um, kind of our product and what we're doing, and I'll let you watch it, and then we'll